Hey everybody, my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. Um, the InterNACHI School is the only home inspector college accredited by the US Department of Education, a real home inspector college. And uh, we have training partners, uh, part of our school system you know, all over the world. And we have um, one of the training partners on this live free online InterNACHI webinar. And it's the Home Inspection Institute. And the web address is thehomeinspectioninstitute.com if you wanted to take advantage of all the resources that they provide. And we have some special guests, my buddies Keith and Robert. Um, thanks for, guys for being here today and uh, talking to our home inspectors who are uh, attending the live webinar. We had almost 200 people register for the webinar. Um, and if you feel like asking questions during the webinar, don't hesitate. You got this little chat, little thing uh, at the bottom screen. You can chat a question or you can pose a question using the Q&A. Um, and if uh, you like other people's questions, you can upvote them so they bubble up to the top. Um, but I really appreciate it. Keith, are you with us? Yes. Hey, Keith, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, I hear uh, we should be talking about narratives today. Yeah, today we're going to be talking about narratives. Um, narrative, we're going to go through what a narrative is, how it should be properly written, and then key tips for narrative writing. And then we're going to go into some specific examples for specific situations that I hope will help you improve your narrative writing. Um, for sure. So hey, I'll go through so what's what's sorry, your position what's your position at the school at the home inspection institute so i am the owner the ceo of the home inspection institute we opened the school in 2008 it is in new jersey in Voorhees, new jersey um i'm the primary instructor and also a field mentor uh, Rob Learmont, who is also on, is also one of the teachers at the school. So we have about six or seven different teachers and about a dozen different field mentors and that the students um, interact with in their educational basis. So some of some of what you're about to see is specific to New Jersey, but I would say if it's different than your state or if you live in a non-regulated state, it probably still applies. And Jersey is a regulated all point. state. Yes, it is. And uh, you're, you're um, an accredited school, approved school, and you do CE and also uh, licensing training. That's correct, yes. And you were a home inspector yourself for many years. Yes, I've been a home inspector since, ooh, I think 2006 in New Jersey. I am also a uh, professional engineer. I'm a construction official, building inspector. Uh, I have background in the construction trades. Um, I have others ancillary licenses like radon and termite that I use in my practice. Awesome. And uh, just for everybody to know, um, obviously you can see me, uh, we can't see you, um, Keith, is on a computer because he was uh, traveling and working all at the same time and he didn't want to miss the webinar. He's on a computer and the webcam won't be on, but uh, um, obviously we can hear him. Uh, we can't hear you if you're attending the webinar right now, but feel free to ask questions using the Q&A or the chat feature. So thanks, Keith and Robert. Um, Keith, go ahead, uh, take over the screen and uh, um, tell us about narratives. Okay. So what I have found, and I think most people would agree, narrative writing is probably the most important and also the most difficult part of being a home inspector. Um, you can have come from various, have various experiences in certain construction trades and a lot, you know, identifying defects and such is much easier than putting it into the written word properly. So in my experience, if you were to ask me, what is the most difficult part of being a home inspector? It is writing a good, a proper, effective narrative. 
So one of the goals for today is to help with that task. Um, so we're going to go through what is a narrative, narrative writing tips, examples of valuable narratives, and then narratives for specific situations. And if I can interrupt you, Keith, I remember when I was doing home inspections long, long time ago, uh, you know, we would write by hand on a checklist on the NCR form, you know, and press real hard so that the ink goes through all the forms. And so there was never this resource where, you know, you could uh, grab some narratives and copy paste it into your report. But now obviously with software, um, that's available to you. So that's what you're talking about, grabbing um, some sentences that are already pre-written for a particular observation or condition of a home and entering that into your software. Correct. And the way you do that doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Um, most of you probably use a software program like Spectora or HomeGage, Home Inspector Pro, one of those. But from the very beginning, I just use Microsoft Word and I keep a file of all of my narratives so I can just copy and paste them. I just, I'm not oh, very pleased with the generic narratives that come with most of the software programs. Um, so I prefer to write my own and save save the ones I like so I can use them again. And I'll talk more about that in a, in a second. Keith, and in most states, you really don't even need to type your narratives. I know in New Jersey, you're, you're allowed to hand write your narratives. <laughs> um, and some of the old timers still do that. Keith, if I can add one thing real quick. Uh, as an instructor and a uh, former student uh, graduate from the school, I emphasize to my all of my students that the narratives are so important to be clear and concise because the time that you spend on callbacks for people asking for clarification is time you're not getting paid for. So if you can be clear and concise in your narrative where nobody has to call back and ask a question, that's the goal of a good narrative. I agree. Right. And secondarily, I think the highest goal, especially in a state like New Jersey, is to make it sue proof. So that's, those are some of the tips I'm going to point out today to uh, limit your liability. When I first started writing narratives in 2006, I did it in a completely different way than I do it now. Um, I have been through one major lawsuit. And that has made me modify my approach to narrative writing to better protect myself in the future. You don't ever want to get sued, but when you do, it is a very painful, laborious, and can be lengthy experience. And you can start, you will start to question your own confidence. Um, so that taught me to revise many of my narratives, and that's what I want to convey to you today, what I have learned. Okay, let's move on. So, <clears throat> and I tell this to my students, you as a home inspector, you are really a poor man's family practitioner, you're a doctor. If you think about it, there's a lot of similarities, right? We both use our senses, we use tools, whether it be a scalpel or a voltage detector. We use our experience and our knowledge to diagnose, in a doctor's case, a health issue or a material, in our case, a material defect. Doctors issue written prescriptions or remedies to correct something. And we also issue narratives to give direction to the client on what to do to address the issue. And we both have to, uh, we also have to convey the implications of such, why we're recommending this. And we also further, uh, we recommend further evaluation when we don't know the correct recommendation or the cause of a situation. General practitioners will refer people to an oncologist or an orthopedist 
whereas home inspectors may refer them to a licensed plumber or an electrician. One thing, you, after being an inspector for more than a decade, or even after a few, more, a few years, you're never going to know everything about everything. It's impossible. Um, there's just too much information, construction techniques change, materials change, so on and so forth. So doctors and home inspectors are constantly learning. Also, both require good bedside manners. Talking to a doctor, like for example, a, a cancer diagnosis is a special skill a doctor has. A home inspector reviewing results of their findings requires good bedside manners, not to be an alarmist, for example. Both have to carry insurance for errors and omissions or malpractice. Both use forensics, right? Both, both need historical evidence of what they're looking at in order to make a recommendation. So I always like to give this analogy if you're a home inspector, you're a poor man's family doctor. If you're a really good home inspector, you're a rich man's family doctor. But there's a lot of similarities. Uh, so in, in those, for those two cases, there's a lot of overlap. Okay, so what is a narrative? The narrative, and this is my definition, the written statement that identifies and recommends a remedy for a material defect. That's my definition. I don't really like the word narrative, um, but it's just become in the industry, you know, the colloquial word that we use to write down our recommendations. If you look at Merriam Webster, um, the definition of a narrative is something that is narrated, a story or an account. I don't think that really is the proper thing that we do. I like to think of what we do, we recommend remedies. And if I look at Merriam-Webster, a remedy is something that corrects or counteracts a problem. So if, I, if we had to start this whole industry over from the beginning, I would love it if we had, we uh, refer to our written recommendations as remedies versus narratives. <clears throat> Okay, now let me know if there's any questions and so forth. I see once someone in the q and a I'll let Rob uh, or Ben administer that. They were just asking Ooh, if you're yeah. going to share some of your narrative share a narrative as an example. I said you do that oh, later. Defi I definitely do that. I definitely do that so um by law, and you're, if you're in a regulated state, or even if you're not in a regulated state where you have perhaps have to identify a material defect, the definition is somewhat similar. Now, I'm going to read what a material defect is in New Jersey by the New Jersey statutes, but it's, they're all very similar, um, taken from the Texas precedent. A material defect means a condition or functional aspect of a structural component or system that is readily ascertainable during a home inspection that substantially affects the value, habitability, or safety of the dwelling, but does not include decorative, stylistic, cosmetic, or aesthetic aspects of the system, structure, or component. Now, here's an interesting take. Uh, take the standards of practice that are defined in regulated states, they're really there to help us, to protect us from liability. And one way is to define what a material defect is. So by most states or wherever you practice, in your reports, your narratives only have to pertain to this, this specific definition of a material defect. However, as we know in the real world, according to the standard of care, most home inspectors go way beyond what is really required. If we strictly interpreted the definition of a material defect, our reports would be one or two pages long, if you think about it. But the problem we have is 
who writes these state statutes? Lawyers write state statutes. And lawyers like to leave things in definitions that are open to interpretation that can be argued in a court of law. For example, that word substantially affects the value. What does that mean? Substantially affects the value. Someone can argue one dollar substantially affects the value of my home because I have no money. On and on. If the definition of a material defect was written by an engineer, it would probably say something whereby the value has to be at least 5% the cost of the home or something more specific. But because they put words like substantially in there, it's open-ended. Therefore, most inspectors and what we teach at our school is to go above and beyond the strict interpretation of a material defect. Um, now, so the key words there also are value, habitability, or safety of the dwelling. So I'm going to ask you a question. Can you name one readily ascertainable, that means it's visible, condition that substantially affects the value of the home, but not the habitability or the safety of the home? Can anyone name one thing? No, there's only one, I have had a conversation, one person that um, came up with one, and that would be asphalt roof shingles. I'm not sorry, I'm not sorry asphalt. Uh, Asbestos-based roof shingles, where they're not leaking, um, so they don't affect the safety or the habitability, but they do affect the value, because if they have to be removed, it can be very costly. If, if this definition of material defect was rewritten, I would love to have the component that were the value removed from it completely because there really isn't anything that's readily ascertainable that affects the value of the home. That is not a safety or habitability issue. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Feel free to stop at any time and, and use the chat bar um, and as we move forward. All right. So what has to be in a narrative? What are the components? There's four parts that must be in every narrative. And I don't and you could put this in one sentence or a paragraph. It doesn't matter. But you must define the component which is what is it that you're pointing out? The siding, the deck posts, the electrical junction box, the outlet, the condition, what is incorrect about it? The recommendation, you have three choices here for recommendation. Um, repair it, monitor it, and further evaluation required. So the recommendation is, what do I recommend the buyer do about this component and condition I've identified? You have to clearly put in your reports one of those three things. One thing I've learned through the years, when back in 2006, when I was a cocky brand new home inspector and thought I knew it all, I would almost never use further evaluation required because a they're hiring me and paying me money to inspect this house. I should know everything and I shouldn't be say, hey, saying now you got to pay an extra couple hundred dollars to bring in a plumber or an electrician. But what I've learned through the years is that's the proper thing to do is to bring in a specialist. Cause you're not, unless you know it perfectly, what the implication and condition is, you're not going to know as much as a specialist. Just like a doctor is not going to, a general practitioner is not going to know what's wrong with your blood without going to an oncologist, perhaps. So 
I find myself using further evaluation required by a specialist more often now than I did 10, 15 years ago. Um, and perhaps the most important part of the narrative is you have to define the implication or the significance, which is what is the consequence if I do not undertake the recommendation that I just wrote? What may happen? I look at, uh, as part of the class, I look at the disciplinary actions that like state boards take. In like New Jersey, the Home Inspection Advisory Committee under the Department of Community Affairs has a listing of uh, penalties and uh, you know, actions taken against home inspectors. And one of the most common ones is the inspector did not identify the implication or the significance of the recommendation. They may have identified the problem. They may have identified what to do next, the recommendation, but they didn't state the significance or the implication, what may happen. You can't leave that part out. <clears throat> okay. Moving along here. So general narrative tips. Um, and this is what I've done throughout the years. There are certain systems or components that nine times out of 10, I'm going to call out a specialist. A, because they can be costly to fix or B, because I, can't see enough of the component, like the interior of a liner, um, or there's something that could be safety involved. So generally, I always have at least one narrative in all of my reports for these things. Flashing, wall penetrations, roof, heating appliances that produce carbon monoxide, fireplaces, electrical panels, sewer lateral, and decks and balconies. And I'm sure there's others, but so I generally, um, all I have to do, or all you have to do is find one material defect with any of those. The other one is water in, a, in the basement. Um, any of those things whereby you can now make a recommendation to call in a specialist to further evaluate and perhaps provide a quotation. So, um, for example, if the house is more than 20 years old, I'm always gonna recommend the sewer lateral be scoped by a specialist. If I see one thing wrong with a deck or a balcony, like maybe the ledger board was nailed and not lag bolted, I'm going to call in a deck specialist and what I'm going to say in my report while repairing this material defect that I identified, evaluate the entire deck, evaluate the entire roof, evaluate the entire electrical panel while he's there because he's going to most likely anyways. And you don't want to get a call saying, yeah, I brought out this, uh, electrical contractor he fixed that double tap that you identified but he found out these 12 other things that were wrong that happens that's going to happen because they are the licensed specialist so i make it a report when i call out a material defect on one of these components i will expand the scope of the narrative to have them fully evaluate it thereby reducing my liability. Okay, um, let's go up one. So I think actually, I think I have to apologize. I think I skipped that slide. Right, let's go back to it. So this is slide number nine. Um, when it comes to implications, don't use absolutes in your narratives. Use conditionals or adverbs. 
the roof may be leaking. The joist may be undersized. The piping may be rusting from the inside because it's galvanized. Um, I don't, I very rarely will put an absolute in my report. And if you'll notice, most doctors don't either. And most attorneys don't either when they're arguing a case, because maybe means anything could happen at least once. Um, do not offer approvals. I see home inspectors do this all the time. The roof is perfectly fine um no need to worry about it or the deck is perfectly installed unless you know that for sure and you've built decks and studied decks or this or that what you're doing is you're offering now a warranty or a guarantee to the buyer because anything can fail in the future i don't care how well installed it is so I don't put good things in my reports, and I state that my, right in my reports. The following report will only report negative or material defect issues. Components that are working in a proper order are not commented about. about. If you do that, you've now just given yourself a, war a warranty to the buyer. So I would shy away from that. Uh, I'd already talked about this, but do not shy away from further evaluation required. And I like to point to the old adage, when it rains, it pours. You ever notice when you're inspecting something and you find, let's say, an electrical panel, one little thing wrong, two, three wrongs, then there's other things, things wrong with it. Usually, um, or the roof framing or any part of the house. Usually, if you find one thing wrong, you can expect other related things to be wrong, too, because probably the same person did it, and probably without permits, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why I, I love to use further evaluation required, because when it rains, it pours. In your narratives, and you can also use this as a general statement in your report, but you should always recommend that you, uh, your recommendations be undertaken prior to settlement. In the one lawsuit that I had, I did not have that statement in there prior to settlement. They go about ripping everything apart, blah, 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 and doing things after settlement. But by then it was too late. They didn't fix what I had recommended before settlement had they done that they would have found the hidden things that came about later and always save your narratives i think of each each one of my reports i think of as a piece of art a book um, a painting and my narratives i save them so i can use them again i don't want to rewrite my narratives again and i'll put them in a category <clears throat> in my file my word file and that way it helps me to write reports pretty quickly. I can just scroll through to the right section. A well-written narrative should be saved and cherished and used again and again. Um, let me give you some examples. Um, monitor recommend the basement walls are covered, concealed. The buyer should be aware that hidden concealed damage may exist. That's an example of using a conditional. Any questions on that? Okay, this we already talked about. Let's go on to the next slide. Can you touch so, on when I was talking prior about, to Keith, can you touch on yeah. prior to settlement a little bit more? Uh, and where do you put the language <laughs> prior to settlement? Uh, I'll show you right here. That's a good question. So prior to the sale of the transaction of the home, prior to closing, <clears throat> um, is what I mean. Some people will 
the proper thing to probably say is prior to the end of the inspection period, but we know that's impossible because most states have a seven or a 10 or a 15 day inspection period. It's just not going to be possible. So what I mean, prior to taking, buying, possessing the home, have all of your recommendations under completed, undertaken, not afterwards. And I have an example of that right here on the screen. So when I say expand the scope of the recommendation, I was talking about further evaluation required. This is an example. <clears throat> the garage door infrared sensor should be properly installed within six inches of the floor level. Otherwise, a person animal can be caught below the door and not trigger the IR sensors in order to reverse the door closing function. The qualified contractor should verify full and safe operation of the door at, the, at that time prior to settlement. That's what I mean by prior to settlement. Because he may, there be, might be other things wrong with that garage door opener, just a simple example. And a good specialist probably will. They know more than you do. And they're going to point it out. Good ones are going to point it out. Anyway, here's another example. Repair. At least one roof rafter has become split in the attic. It should be repaired sister to prevent localized sag or collapse. It is recommended that a roofing contractor be hired to ensure the entire roof structure and all framing is intact and safe and proper <clears throat> prior to settlement. You may find just one cracked rafter, one cracked joist, or one poor end bearing, but you're probably not going to find them all. Um, so this is an example of you're already calling out a specialist to fix a material defect. While he's there, have him verify there are no others. Okay. Moving on. I don't know. I know some states you don't have a seller's disclosure, but I think <coughs> most of states you do. So the seller's disclosure is the written document that the seller of the home signs off about what they know about the house. Use it. Ask the realtor or the buyer, is there one? Read it. Read it before you start your inspection. Um, and I put this in my reports. If there is no seller's disclosure, I'll put that in there. There is no seller's disclosure available. This means that historical evidence regarding the home is not available from current former residents. Therefore, prior issues such as water infiltrations, etc., may not be available to the inspector. The buyer should be aware that this limits the information that is available to the inspector. Uh, is anyway, recommended solicit the information from the construction office, neighbors, blah blah blah. Um, Although a seller's disclosure is optimal, is optional, the lack thereof can sometimes indicate the seller does not want to reveal possible material defects that they may be aware of, right? Because they, if they don't, if they have a seller's disclosure and they know there's an issue like water in the basement and they say no on there, they're, they're, they're eligible for fraud for, I think, up to seven years. So and sellers know this. So by not offered, if I if I'm doing a house on inspection, and the residents have lived there ten years, and there's no seller's disclosure, a red flag goes off in my head. Well, why not? And sometimes there's a legitimate reason. Maybe it was an estate sale or some other reason, and that's fine. But I'm still going to put this in there. Again, I'm trying to limit my liability. Um, now, also, if there is a seller's disclosure, use it as well. For example, let's say the seller's disclosure said, there's no evidence water ever entered my basement. I will make a narrative. 
There is no evidence of water accumulation on the basement floor. The walls are covered. A sump pump is installed and has some pumps and a French drain visible along with a battery backup system, blah, blah, blah. The seller's disclosure did not reveal any previous water penetration issues to the basement. If water penetration occurs in the future, a waterproofing expert may be needed to rectify the issue, which can be expensive. Even a sump pump and French drain are not a guarantee against water infiltration to the basement. One of the most common things home inspectors get sued about is water into the basement. So here what I'm doing is I'm stating the seller's disclosure said there was not water in the basement. I didn't see any water in the basement. There's some limitations. And if, even if you do get water in the basement, there's no guarantee a sump pump and a French drain are going to work perfectly. So what I'm doing there is I'm sharing the liability. All right, uh, and this is what I just read right here. That narrative. Okay, let's move on to slide 14. Further investigation required. Now, I'm, what I'm saying here is, obviously, I think you all know this. Don't use code references. Once you Once you identify a code, a good attorney for the plaintiff will uh and remember in a civil lawsuit it's just preponderance of evidence is not beyond a reasonable doubt like it is in the in the criminal world so that means they just need to find 50 percent in the client's favor um so civil lawsuits are to me a much more dangerous than criminal lawsuits because a they involve money and uh, B, they take so long. And C, the proof of evidence is so is so much less extensive than in a criminal case. So do not use code references. What I tell my students is use modern building science recommendations. For example, the garage man door may not be a fire rated door. It has been painted. If it is determined that it is so, then consider replacing this door with an exter exterior fire rated door for fire safety. This would be required with modern building science recommendations, or you could also use good building practices, et cetera. But don't put the word code in there. You're not a code inspector. You're generally not measuring things, generally. Okay. Um, obtain all proof possible on new appliances. Here's an example. The furnace, that fur let's say you come across the house, the furnace was just replaced, looks beautiful, nothing wrong with it. Um, you don't know how that far that vent connector is going into the chimney or anything else about it. So I will put this, I'll do this for air conditioners, I'll do this for furnaces, I'll do this for water heaters, I'll do this for kitchen stoves. The furnace was recently, uh, or in this case, was replaced, manufactured in 2018. It is recommended the buyer obtain the receipts, warranty, permits, etc., for all newly installed appliances to ensure it was properly and safely installed. And if it's more than one year, I would recommend servicing. And I do this on every furnace I come across. Every furnace manufacturer out there says, you should, you should service your furnace once annually as a minimum. If I don't see a service tag there, or it's not in the seller's disclosure that it's been serviced within the last year of my date of arrival, I am gonna recommend it be serviced and a heating certification certification be obtained prior to settlement because carbon monoxide is a killer lawsuit could get into the millions of dollars and ben i think you just uh, shared a story on this on one of your emails broadcast the other day for example yep. when you were working with joe denneler <clears throat> so i want and plus 
if something goes wrong down in the future, I want the buyers to have the receipt, the warranty, or the roof shingles, whatever, the manual, so they can refer to it. Okay. Now, limitations, lack of historical evidence. I say this narrative is in every one of my reports, and I think it makes me almost sue proof. This is the big one I learned from my lawsuit. Um, In that particular case, the first floor was carpeted, and the uh, buyer was going to redo the floors. He wanted to remove the carpeting and refinish all the wood floors. When he removed the carpeting, he found a slight hump at a door threshold over a bearing beam, the height of a cell phone, which I see in most houses. But he sued me saying he needed all the floor framing on the entire 5,286 square foot replaced. Um, So I've learned to put this in my reports. Further investigation required. Several areas of the home are blocked by storage, clutter, et cetera. These areas include the garage and interior walls, closets. The clutter furnishings present may conceal other anomalies like structural issues, et cetera. The buyer should be aware that hidden concealed damage, wood destroying insect damage can exist and may be prohibitively expensive to repair immediate. It is recommended, <clears throat> excuse me, It is recommended, I pressed the wrong button there, folks. Uh, It is recommended that these areas be made accessible and re-inspected prior to settlement to ensure no anomalies exist. And then I'll add the pictures of clutter. I'll add the pictures of the boxes in the garage or the shelving in the basement or the clothes stack pile high in the closets. And therefore, I have now severely reduced my liability. I've documented the limitation, and now I've even been making a a recommendation that that clutter storage be removed and re-inspected. Had I had that narrative in my report on that day, uh, I would not have been subject to a frivolous lawsuit. All right. HOA condominiums. I always like to say this. I'll take a picture of the whole complex. The home is part of a condominium or HOA. It is recommended the buyers obtain and read the past year's meeting notes to understand if there are unusual or ongoing repairs. Uh, But the buyer should be aware of common shared areas are not included as part of the inspection. Floor slopes, again, this is the one that got me. You know, even in new construction, you're allowed to have floor slopes. Uh, What's the equation? L divided by 240 has to be one or less. Um, Maximum of half inch. There's drywall, et cetera, et cetera. And the slope in that house that I did was even less than modern recommendations, but he still went after me. So anytime I see an imperfect floor or staircase, even though I know it's within code, even though I know it's not a structural or habitability issue, I know that they could use that value component of the definition of material defect to make a case against me. They could say, there's a hump here that affects the value of my house. Um, No, it's not a safety issue. You can't trip on it. It's not a habitability issue, but. You're saying it affects the value of the house. So anytime I come across a floor slope, I will have this narrative. The floor in at least one door jam is slanted, not level. The flooring would have to be removed to determine if it can be leveled. This could be expensive. Floor slopes, however, are allowed up to a certain extent, even in new construction. If this is a concern to the buyer, a contractor should be hired prior to settlement to remedy. Remember, you generally rarely get sued on the important stuff like foundation or, I mean, unless it fails or things like that. You get sued upon stuff that homeowners notice. 
believe it or not. Um, wood destroying insects. If that, even if I'm not getting paid to do an MPMA 33 form, I do usually, but there's people that don't want it. I still am going to point out termite problems or wood destroying insect problems. It's still, I may not give them the MPMA 33 form because they didn't pay for it, but I'm going to damn as hell put it in my regular report. So, for example, the exterior has been treated for termites. This usually indicates previous termite activity and or damage. Hidden concealed activity damage can be expected. Um a copy of those reports should be provided to ensure any possible previous discovered damage was properly treated. I'm going to put that in my report, and I'll take a picture of maybe the drill plug on the outside of the house. Um, conversely, if I find active wood-destroying insect damage, I will put this in there. Don't forget this one. Confirmation that no damaged wood remains anywhere in the home should be provided by the termite repair contractor. Because you know, if you find termite damage in a basement or a crawl space, you know it's up in the walls and could be up in the attic, in the floors, concealed. So I want to make the buyer aware, yeah, you took that sheet rock down because you wanted to fix that room and repaint it or whatever. And now you find all this termite damage. Well, at least I told you that was probable or possible. And I said, have them fix everything. Not my problem anymore. Okay, use your local construction office. Now here in New Jersey, every municipality has to have a local you know, code enforcement agency. Use them, you know, that, I know it's their job just to approve and inspect it. I'm, an, I'm a construction official, subcode official, building inspector and all that. New permits and, and new construction or modifications. But I use them, I refer to them a lot. For example, the rear porch beams are not properly supported, blah, blah, blah. It should be confirmed that each post has a proper footing. It should be verified with the local construction office that this deck porch was installed with a proper permit to help ensure its integrity. In lieu of that, a contractor should uh, evaluate the deck. You've got a basement with a six foot ceiling. I'm going to say in there, make sure this was finished. And there's a closed permit. I see ABS to PVC glued together. Was this plumbing done with a closed permit? Was this basement finished with uh, a permit? There's no heating in it. There's no outlets in it. Um, decks are very common or additions. And nine times out of 10, they're going to go there and the construction office is going to say, no, there was no permit for that or we have no record of it. So, or it was never closed. They opened a, they opened a permit, but they never closed it. So refer to the construction office, use them. That's what you pay your tax dollars. Uh, another example, it appears that the basement was finished with non-pressure treated wood sill plates nor a moisture barrier below those plates. The sill plates that sit on concrete below grade should be required to be pressure treated or have a moisture barrier. According to modern building science recommendations, this may allow wood deterioration that are in contact with the concrete. It, should, it is recommended to consult with the local construction office to ensure the basement was built with a permit. I've, I've heard of horror stories home inspectors getting sued, people move in. And then even though they got a CO, a certificate of occupancy, it was later found out that that rear porch or that addition was done without a permit. And now who's on the hook for getting that all fixed? The buyer, the owner. Um, all right, that's all I have for general stuff. Hey, Keith, Here is our contact information. Yes. We have uh, two questions. Uh, one question okay. is, can, can these slides be made available uh, for other, you know, to access this PowerPoint? Um, uh, for me, that's fine. I guess, Ben, that might be a question for you. Well, can we, uh, can sure. we talk to Robin and maybe put these slides uh, available on our website? 
Yeah, we can talk to Robin. Um, if you have <coughs> the best thing <coughs> to do, I'm sorry for my cold, mail or email Robin, R O B Y N, at the Home Inspection Institute.com. She is our uh, chief curriculum director. She's got a PhD in uh, curriculum development and school administration. She's very good with that. Um, so it's Robin at the home inspection institute.com. Now I do want to show you one other thing. And Robert can really you, quick. You can type in. Into oh, the was there another question? Yeah, it was just a general, what is the most common issue that home inspectors can get sued? Yeah. Well, there's 10 that you generally see. Um, for some reason, Windows always makes that list. I don't know why, but Windows makes a list. But I, and I, I get involved in quite a bit of lawsuits where I'm, I'm I'm either representing the client or the plaintiff or the defendant. Um, but the ones that I see mostly are anything to do with water, water getting into the wall envelopes, into the attic, through the roof. Um, the big one that can kill you though is carbon monoxide poisoning from improper venting, um, foundation walls, not plumb is a common one. Basement water, crawl space water is a common one. Not identifying like lead pipe coming into the house is a common one. Knob and tube wiring, not being identified is a common one. Aluminum wiring, not being identified is a common one. Uh, those are the big ones. You got to figure Generally, it's got to be worth at least $15,000, at least in New Jersey, for them to sue you. Because um, small claims court is not applicable to this type of malpractice claim where there's a contract. So it's got to be something of significant cost. But remember, folks, there are people that sue like it's their job. And they'll move from house to house to house and sue. And it's such a litigious environment that we live in. I mean, every commercial, at least on my local station, is always a lawyer commercial. You know, Morgan and Morgan or blah, blah, blah. You know. No longer do we work for our money. We, we work to become parasites and take it from others that do. Um, but usually anything to do with water. Also, a big one is missing uh, underground buried oil tank. Although in New Jersey, we're exempt from that by the standards of practice. Um, I wanted to show you one last thing. Uh, let me see here. Share. Whoop. I want to share a new share. New share. There we go. Let me see. Can I share it? Please. So these are my field notes. I recommend you all keep a copy of your, my field, what my field notes are, they're a combination of things I can't remember and all my narratives. And I have them all categorized by category for a specific situation. Um, you know, whether it be addition permits, closure, seller's disclosure. This is 1,565 pages long that I've assembled through the years. And what I do is not only do I put all my narratives in here, I put my diagrams and I put the things I can never remember. Like, for example, what is the allowable slope on a wall or a floor, that type of thing. Uh, it's code stuff, but um, I keep little tables at the top of each section. So when I'm writing my narratives, I can say modern building science typically recommends, you know, recommends that your anchor bolt be within you know, four to six inches deep and a foot of the edge of the sill plate, et cetera, something like that. And no farther than six feet apart, four feet apart, or whatever it is. So 
Um, so Pete, I keep all of these. Yes. When, when do you use, um, when do you decide to use illustrations? And by the way, if, um, if you wanted to use illustrations, uh, InterNACHI's gallery is at nachi.org slash gallery, uh, free and open uh, high res uh, illustrations. When do you choose to use an illustration with a narrative? Um, when I have one that makes the situation more clear, when I can easily show how it should be done versus how it is. I would say outside of the general ones, I have an illustration for almost everything. And I might have just copy it, but I generally have an illustration for everything. Um, and, sorry, Nick, but a lot of these are, are from Ashy. No problem. No problem. Uh, um, I'm an Ashy. I'm an Ashy member as well, so I have a lot of their illustrations. I just I'm going to so. chat to all the attendees the the web address of InterNACHI's gallery. Hey, um, what about pictures? Now that's illustrations, but what about when do you how do you uh, associate, or do you take digital pictures? How do you associate digital pictures with your uh, narratives? And I've got a story about that. One time I got a, me... a call from a real estate agent saying that they're at the property right now and they're looking at infestation of termites in the living room that I missed. So I asked to uh, visit the property again with them while they were there in order to diffuse the temperature in the room. And I came with my inspection report and digital camera and uh, digital pictures. And it turns out, uh, long story short, there was actually a baby grand piano sitting on top of a carpet in the living room, right where the infestation was. <laughs> so I was able to diffuse that problem uh, using pictures. And that actual picture was in the report and they, they, didn't, see, they didn't bother to look at the inspection report actually. Um, what about pictures in your narratives? So like I said, for further evaluation required. Remember that one where there's clutter, et cetera? Yeah. I oh like I always like right here. Right. Several this is a whole I just finished this report this morning before this. This is several our areas are, are blocked by clutter storage. And I'll take pictures of the clutter in the storage. And I'll take pictures of bedrooms and things like closets like that. Just like this, and I'll put them in my report. Just because those things like what happened to you are going to happen to everybody. So you want to, anything you can't get to or difficult, you take a picture of it and you add it as a further evaluation required. Yep. And for most of my recommendations, I'll add a picture here, like here's a structural concern, you know, structural clues, and I'll compare side by side to the actual picture that I took. So every, every narrative of mine has it at least a digital picture from on site yeah. and i'd say 75 to 80 percent have a backup schematic uh drawing like the one on the left here that i save in my narratives a lot of the questions from the webinar attendees were about further evaluation prior to settlement or closing or the property transaction between the owners of the property and you could have that in the agreement um, you could, I guess you, you have a choice to say that with every narrative or at least once in the report. Um, I had it in my inspection agreement as well, that my client would re agree to read the report in its entirety and follow my recommendations prior to closing if it was a real estate transaction or immediately if it was uh, like a, um, a, a, a maintenance inspection. Yes. Yeah. I, I use that approach right here. I have it here. Um, I have a general statement way up at the top of the report um, that should be done before closing. But I found that, at least in that case, that they didn't even read. They only went right to the individual recommendations. So that's when I started putting prior to settlement on everything. That is the issue. Uh, software providers have... Uh told me that a lot of inspection reports that are now cloud-based, they can see that inspection reports aren't even read most of the time. So it might be uh, an idea for your local business attorney to sit down with you and put that uh, agreement in, uh, put that clause in your agreement um, that they will read the report in its entirety, the full report, not just a summary 
or whatever they decide is important. And then to follow, they'll agree also to follow all of your recommendations that you wrote out in the report. Um, how, what about uh, writing in past tense? So I teach my, my students to write in past tense, never write things like, for example, the heating system turns on or the water temperature is 110 degrees or the fixtures are flushing and draining properly. Um, we always write in the past tense so that if an attorney is forced to read your report, um, you said that the fixtures flushed and drained in the past uh, and you know the situation obviously is different today um, what do you think about writing in the past yeah i i usually i don't say in the past i usually say during the inspection yeah um during the ins but then i won't it, let's say the for example that toilet flush fine i'm not even going to say anything about it yeah because then i'm giving a warranty on that toilet right um <laughs> But if it didn't, I'm going to say during the inspection, the toilet did not flush. And now make a recommendation for repair and obvious implication. But I'll say, I'll say during the inspection. Yep. And uh, yeah. a lot of, a lot of um, real estate agents that I bumped into would just simply complain about the length uh, of my inspection reports because I had so much to say. Sometimes my narratives were a very large paragraph. And so um, we had the idea that you could put your narratives that you say all the time for every home, no matter what, they're usually about maintenance items. That's why we wrote the home maintenance book, the Internet's home maintenance book. And you can, again, force your client to agree that they read the report and the home maintenance book so that your reports could be supplemented by um, an um, another resource that they agree to um, read. So uh, how long are your reports and do you get complaints about um, too much information? Well, I never get complaints from the buyers about too much information. I think they appreciate that. That's right. Um, I might get complaints from the real, a lot of the realtors are lazy. They just want a summary. Sure. I refuse to give a summary ah. because if you ask me, let's say, just give me a summary. I'm saying, no. Everything in, that I wrote in this report is pertinent. If I give you a summary, that client can now hire an attorney that said, yeah, you had that issue below, but it wasn't in the summary. So therefore, it doesn't count. So I refuse. I've had realtors that won't do business with me because I won't give them a summary. I, I just refuse to do it. Yeah. So I just list everything sequentially. Each thing has its own number to refer to like number 77. And this is a typical report for me. I got, there was no air conditioning on this house and I got 84 issues and it's 67 pages long. There's no summary. There's no, very few maintenance tips. There's no glossary. I just get straight to the meat and potatoes. I want them to know what I found is wrong. Identify the component implication recommendation and um, condition and that's it. Yep. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say anything that's good. I'm not gonna say anything about it. I, I, I got better things to do. If I don't say anything about it, it's good. Uh, Robert just asked me, Ben, can you talk about your last statement about reading the report to get you off the hook for lawsuits? So that was just a local business attorney uh, uh, recommendation that when you and someone else has an agreement and they sign and agree to all the terms you can ask them to do just about anything. So uh, within the agreement, you can have your client agree in writing that they will read the report that, you're, that you will produce. Remember the agreement comes before you uh, step on the property, that they will read the report in its entirety, not just a summary, and will follow all of your recommendations, right? Prior to closing. Uh, I even had a coffee clause I talked about a while back um, that be, that my client agreed to meet with me for one hour over coffee prior to um, suing me. Uh, and no one took me up on that. Um, you know, I figured I would diffuse any conversation, any, any problems over coffee for one hour. Who can, who can stand me for one hour without coming to some kind of resolution? Uh, Thomas asks, what trade or recommendation is called for when floor sags or crooked door openings, et cetera, are noted? Do you, do you identify, do you, 
do you get into the Keith, do you get into the thing where you actually identify the contractor or just say qualified contractor? I get into the specific contractor if I know who that is. Yeah. If it's a window issue, like right here on my screen, yeah. I'll say a window contractor, yeah. roofing, a roofing contractor, plumber, plumber, and structural engineer. If it's so, here's where you draw the line. <clears throat> if something is installed, and broken that's a contractor if something is not installed properly and or not broken that's an engineer that's where you draw the draw the line um you know if if like say so even you got a bearing beam in the basement and the column is rusted you don't need, you don't call in an engineer to repair that column. You call in a contractor to repair that column. It's easy. just going to replace like for like, but when something is designed wrong or missing, that's when we call in a structural engineer. So Keith, you and I, uh, as home inspectors, we, we've each been sued small claims and, and other things. Um, Elvis is uh, asking, um, are, are, will, should every home inspector be required to have a lawyer or just at the time of being sued? And my recommendation is uh, when you start a business, you should have a local business. Uh, local business attorneys are interesting because um, my local business attorney would probably know any other attorney in the community that's gonna sue me. Because remember, I'm, I'm inspecting homes in my uh, neighborhood, in my market area. So that attorney knows other uh, law, law firms and they even know the, the local magistrate, the judges. Um, so they could uh, help you a lot. Um, what do you think? Do you, uh, Elvis asks, um, should every home inspector have a lawyer or just wait until you're sued? I, I think, well, A, in most states require this, your pre-inspection agreement should be reviewed by a lawyer. And most insurance companies will, will ask you that when you apply for E and O insurance. And, uh, you know, like, I know like Joe Denneler, he even has approved pre-inspection contracts for sale for each state. That is important. Uh, uh, very important to make sure your pre-inspection contract has been reviewed by a lawyer and is pertinent to your state, because you're going to get asked that by your insurance company anyways. But I don't think, I, you know, once you get sued, it goes to the insurance company and they have their own attorneys and they may, you know, you, they may ask you which one you prefer, but I don't know. I, I never, I never had any dealings with lawyers until I got my first lawsuit. Um, and Joe Deneler was my attorney. Um, is that's who the insurance company appointed but uh, outside of the pre-inspection agreement and perhaps a generic your your general report review um i would go to that expense that's not going to cost you a lot of money actually you could you know buy the pre-inspection contract if you go on his website and uh after that you refer to the insurance company once you get that notification, you're, you have to notify your insurance company anyway. Let them take care of it from there. Joseph asks, uh, have you ever had callbacks asking if you inspected, for example, the front steps, if you don't put anything in a report about them because they were okay? Yeah, yeah. And I'll say I inspect everything. If I didn't put them in the report, I didn't find a material defect with them. Right. Right, Joseph, like, you know, you're really responsible for the material defects that you observe and deem to be material at the time of the inspection. You're not, not responsible for every defect in the home. So maybe that, that helps as well. You know, if a, if a defect is behind a wall, right, you know, you're not responsible for putting that defect uh, in the report. Um, let's see. Lori asks, does... Does Keith make any statement about or acknowledging inspecting an item that does work as it should? No, I, I, essentially, right? That's what I'm getting. You don't put a lot of goods, nope. right? I don't put in. I don't put any goods. Yeah. Yep. In All fact, right. I'll show you what I. 
I'll show you what I put from oh. my report. Um, I took the screen. <laughs> I put. <laughs> I'll put. Let me take the screen in. Just list a lot, and this maybe we'll end it here. Sure. Um, because I, who do I who I do get complaints from are the sellers saying I was too thorough or only pointed out negative things, and they. I've gotten several negative things out of my Google reviews, not from the buyers, from the sellers only, and they're not my client. But anyway, so I put this in my report. This report only addresses deficiencies. Mm. Satisfactory components are not commented upon. Therefore, the report will typically read as negative only. Each recommendation listed below can be dismissed if a qualified professional provides information documentation that deems these recommendations as unnecessary. That's great. And uh, where do we get uh, your narratives? If we wanted your actual narratives, do you sell your narratives? I do, I do sell my narratives. Again, uh, send an email to Robin at the Home Inspection Institute. Yeah, awesome. And we can also get the, the slides, your slides from today's presentation from Robin as well. Well, yeah. Robert and Keith, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with us. I know you guys are really busy. Uh, it was really good uh, presentation. I really appreciate it, Keith. Thanks for teaching us a little bit more about how to write inspection reports. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having us. Uh, Thanks okay. for having us. Ben. Thank you. Ben and Thank Rob. You so <clears throat> and stay safe and healthy, everybody. I'll see you on the next InterNACHI webinar. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Keith. Bye, everybody.